to Dr. Levine's Practical Neuropsychology. Licensed clinical psychologist Dr. Levine brings viewers success stories by demonstrating how the brain works and neuroscience-based pragmatic ways to retain the brain to improve emotional regulation. So now, please welcome your host, Dr. Levine. Welcome to Dr. Levine's Practical Neuropsychology on Bold Brave TV. Today, we're just going to use uh, this uh, episode to catch up and review some of the lessons we've learned so far. But I'm going to start it out a little bit different. Instead of having a guest story, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story and how I got into this whole field of neuropsychology and why uh, I'm so uh, determined to get the word out. So. The beginning of any story with a human being comes back to their family, right? And I think the important part of of that is just the genetic uh, predispositions from coming from a certain family. And the short story on that is uh, my uh, grandparents, uh, my grandmother on my mother's side, uh, spent 20 years in a state mental health hospital with schizophrenia. And my grandfather on my father's side spent uh, his entire life, adult life, in the state hospital. So this, suffice it to say that there was plenty of mental illness genes in the family uh, to get things started. At a uh, young age, and this was back in the uh, 50s, I was a pretty rowdy kid. I uh, did a lot of tree climbing and fort building. And uh, my mother used to say, you never find me under three foot. I do things like uh, she says, I disassembled the crib to, to escape. So <clears throat> my early uh, uh, childhood, I was pretty frenetic. And in my family household, my grandmother came to live with us when we were four. She was released from the state hospital. So that created a lot of stress in the family. Um, my father's drinking picked way up and uh, my mother had at the time uh, four children and uh, all uh, very small under the age of, of four. And uh, so, and a, and a husband who drank too much and we were pretty poor and my father got laid off we ended up living in the projects. So what was an interesting thing for uh, for me was I was the only white kid in the projects. Not that I was terribly aware of the color difference. Uh, I had a lot of friends, you know, Le Leroy and Junior and all these guys were pretty cool, but I did get quite a few beatings. And I remember pretty strongly at the age of six, getting tired of getting the beating. So I got really angry one day and I just wailed on a bunch of them with a stick. And uh, uh, at that point, uh, I guess I had some level of respect because that kind of ended all the, that violent stuff with, with them at the time. And I kind of went on in, in school. My uh, school was an interesting place for me. Uh, I either was excelled and I got A's or I was totally disinterested and did nothing and got uh, D's or F's. And I really didn't much care uh, whether I got a good grade or not. And uh, my parents didn't pay too much attention. And like most students, I just moved al along. Um, my brothers were much more athletic than, than I, and, uh, partially because I was blind in one eye and lousy at all ball sports, which seemed to be what we played baseball, football, any kind of catching, uh, sport was not exactly going to be my thing. So I, I kind of got, uh, I was at the point where. Uh, even though I was the oldest, uh, my, and my dad was the coach. Uh, he'd only play me the required three innings in right field. 
And my nickname was Drifty because I would just kind of drift off. And when the ball finally got out there, I probably wasn't uh, in any situation to catch it. So suffice it to say, um, I didn't, didn't hang out with the jocks. I kind of hung out first with some of the smarter kids, but I didn't really do that great with the academics and some subjects. So obviously I hung out with uh, the group of misfits, uh, which, you know, we had our share of a recreational drug, shall I say. And uh, by uh, 13, um, uh, I, school wasn't of much interest. I worked quite a bit and, uh, I had always, always worked. I liked that freedom of money. So uh, by the time I was 16, I was an apprentice electrician making pretty good money. Um, no interest in school at all. Uh, got into trouble for truancy. Ended up going to college uh, to make my mother happy. Got a year of college in and then they uh, asked for my high school transcripts and I ended up getting my uh, uh, second year of college and my last year of high school at the same time, impulsively joined the Army um, at the end of the Vietnam War. Um, I was looking to go to the war, but so I joined the 101st Airborne without knowing that they were coming back. So uh, fortunately, I didn't ac actually end up in Vietnam. But all through this, um, very inconsistent. Uh, I, I made a lot of rank, but I also got into a lot of trouble in the military. I went in as a private, came out as a captain, but I, I went up and down uh, with all kinds of, of trouble, some of it legal in, in the military. Got out, went to work uh, in business and uh, at a computer company. And one of the things I discovered uh, it was kind of weird fitting into the group because all these middle managers would be talking about playing golf or picnicking or whatever they did with their family on the weekend. And, uh, you know, I, that just wasn't my background. So it took me a little while to, to, to try to figure out how to fit in, uh, deal with it, and uh, continued on kind of a progression of computer jobs. Uh, in the Army, I had switched to finance for security, and uh, I was a director of finance at a computer company when the vice president of finance said to me, uh, uh, Roger, you're not a very detailed person. I said, ruh -roh. He said, but you're really good with computers, so I'm going to move you over to R&D, and that started a career in uh, technology in the R&D area, developing products. Uh, got my own software company after a while, pretty successful, living on my yacht. And then, unfortunately, while I was living on that yacht, I had a, a boat explosion. And uh, I was in the middle of the explosion. And when it blew up, it blew me out of the engine room in a ball of fire. The whole boat lit up just like your gas grill goes room. Well, my 43 foot yacht lit up from one end to the other when the when the uh, fumes exploded in in this uh, this boat. And uh, I had 35 uh, percent second and third degree burns, but the head injury was the worst. Um, I went to leave the hospital. I went to stand up, and I fell right down because. I didn't even have balance. Uh, I discovered that I was making bad decisions. I went through millions of dollars of operating capital in my company thinking I would get back. But one of the problems with uh, TBIs is that um, you're not aware of your own bad decision making. And I ended up on Social Security disability, lost 17 pairs of Gla prescription glasses my first year, fell into anxiety and depression, had PTSD, pretty uh, severe uh, nightmares, hypervigilance, 
um, irritability, derealization. Uh, I was a mess. And uh, on the disability for a couple of years, but I became very, very depressed and figured I needed to do something again. I was always a very active, active person. So I started driving truck for a couple hours. I bought a truck and just when I could work for two hours, I would work and then spend a lot of time in the truck until I could drive again. And this went on for a little couple of years. And then I learned that if something was structured, I could relearn it. So I took the Kaplan GRE course seven times to get my eighth grade math, vocabulary, whatever skills back. And I went uh, for the next four years and redid an undergrad degree in psychology. By that time, I was functioning reasonably well, and I went to back to work as an entry-level business analyst in a computer company, continued to go to school nights. And after a couple of years, they said, well, you got to start seeing patients. And I thought, uh oh, so uh, I found out I was pretty good at the psychology stuff, I guess, part of it because I've had a lot of experience. And I, I do have to say, from the time of the explosion and the depression, the anxiety and the PTSD, I was getting uh, psych psychological help. And in the beginning, some of the therapy was kind of counterproductive and kind of set me back some exposure therapy flooding for the PTSD. But at the time, one of my psychologists had suggested mindfulness. And so I started practicing mindfulness. And with that, a lot of things improved and I continued to get care. I was a member of a burn survivors group, got a lot of support from them. And uh, like I said, I was able to go back to work, kept getting my degree. Now I was being a therapist, using all this experience to help people and uh, managed to work my way up to being vice president of product for the software company I was in and uh, decided to take on uh, being a therapist and in doing this uh, as a full-time occupation. So I retired from my computer job and now I'm using all that experience of, of uh, by the way, that active kid probably had ADHD. I've been diagnosed with ADHD since then, but uh, part of my whole story is dealing with ADHD. So now, <clears throat> because a lot of ADHD folks have trauma and substance abuse and other issues, uh, one a major portion of my business is helping those with ADHD. So that's a little bit about uh, my story and some of the tools I use to uh, recover. And when we come back from break, We'll get back into uh, what are the tools we need to do use to be able to deal with stress, anxiety, trauma, and turn things around. So we'll be right back after this brief commercial. This is Dr. Levine on Bold Brave TV. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to Easy easysense.com and learn how with your help we can fight these horrific brain disorders that's easysense.com to learn more and help support the broderick foundation author radio show host and coach john m hawkins reveals strategies to help gain perspective build confidence find clarity achieve goals 
John M. Hawkins' new book, Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse, Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them, rediscover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. So welcome back. And this is Dr. Levine, and we're go now going to do a little bit of a summary of some of the things we've learned in previous episodes and set the stage for going forward. So give me just a moment, and I'm going to bring up uh, Another window, and <clears throat> hopefully we're seeing a mind, body, skills, and cognitive wellness chart. Maybe my engineer can let me know if that's the case. So, <clears throat> what I what I wanted to talk here is some mind body skills and some cognitive wellness tools that we need to learn and along uh, if uh, the left is a uh, chart of the the skills and then along the right are some of the tools so one of the first things that we learned was we have to become more aware of how our stress is impacting our emotions are impacting our functioning so I thought the uh, one to 10 scale where three is normal functioning, we're not aware of, of uh, adrenaline and cortisol affecting us. Five is where our obsessing is starting, where we're worrying or problem solving or anticipating, working our way up. Six being fight or flight avoidance. Uh, seven, we're starting to feel the physiological impact and uh, eight being compulsively driven and nine getting to a panic attack. So one of the things is having this tool, this scale, we're able to know how aroused we are and come up with the proper tool to deal with it. Some of the other skills we have to do is we have to learn how to relax or center as, as uh, in terms of bringing that uh, uh, arousal down so that we can think more clearly. We have to strengthen our discipline. One of the issues with most, um, most problems with stress and anxiety is we make it worse by trying to avoid unpleasant feelings. So we have to develop the discipline to be able to tolerate those feelings, that unpleasantness, and stay with it while we're implementing our new tools. We have to have new ways of thinking so we don't work it up. We need uh, to strengthen our attention so that even if we are aroused, we can let go of some of these uh, thoughts that the adrenaline is driving us uh, towards and not allowing us to let go. Uh, emotional regulation, how to actually tree train the brain to, to actually calm those emotions and calm the body. We want to uh, rewire uh, our thinking and our, our patterns, and we gotta be motivated to, to do all this stuff. So one of the first things is just learning that scale and being able to gain insights and in, uh, in intention. So these are all top-down skills where we do use our thinking brain to actually change our behavior and start learning some of the other tools. Now, some of the first tools that we have to start reducing our discomfort that we've learned so far is 
First is the breath. But the breath uh, breathing exercises trigger the relaxation uh, process. They don't necessarily recondition it. The most powerful tool in our uh, tool for reducing the arousal and the discomfort from stress hormones is uh, PMR. That's progressive muscle relaxation. And what the progressive muscle relaxation, the, what the P's on my little chart are all about, is one of the things that when we first start doing the exercise, we'll find that maybe we can attend to the task a third of the time or less because our mind's gonna keep pulling us away. But as we continue to do that ex exercise, we're able to focus and learn more about the attentional, strengthen the attentional centers. So we'll be able to uh, ruminate and worry less because we're able to attend uh, to what is actually going on right now instead of uh, future or past. So what happens is as you condition your brain and you're able to condition the relaxation response under emotional regulation, you're rewiring your brain so that now that you can calm yourself and you can attend to whatever's um, uh, bothering you in the moment. Now, not everyone can start out with PMR and a couple of other uh, approaches that we've used uh, is tapping, uh, which is a uh, emotional freedom technique. Uh, you may have heard it, it's a little tapping routine which helps physiologically reduce the uh, discomfort. We also can use visioning, hypnosis, and biofeedback. These are all tools I use in the uh, therapy to help reduce discomfort and that somantic part of the anxiety, the body part. But then <clears throat> once we reduce the anxiety or stress or discomfort to the point where we can focus and use our thinking mind, then we can start using some of the more, uh, some of the more cognitive based tools to uh, actually um, start uh, change, changing our thinking patterns. The most powerful being mindfulness. Uh, <clears throat> when we learn uh, uh, to condition our mind to attend to being in the present moment, but another powerful effect of mindfulness is to be able to learn to, to separate and dismiss thoughts, which then helps us keep from working things up and it helps us to actually uh, move through things much quicker when we're able to dismiss unhelpful thoughts. We uh, learn some tools for stress management, i.e. how to uh, appraise situations, how to increase our resources, how to reduce our stress. So there's a whole host of stress management tools that we can learn how to better manage our situation, including things like exercise and better sleep and all those kinds of things to increase our resources. Guided meditations to uh, develop gratitude and compassion and other uh, more positive approaches to solving our problems and then embracing some philosophy, some way of reasoning to really check, to make sure that our thoughts are helpful and to learn ways that others have used to think and deal with adversity to better handle our situation. So these are the tools and these are some of the uh, mind-body skills that we pick up in working through the program. And, You'll learn more and more about each of these tools and how to implement them as you continue to watch our program. And I continue to introduce them and uh, help you implement them. So uh, we're gonna <clears throat> uh, continue uh, right after we take a brief break um, for this uh, commercial message.
You're watching Dr. Levine on Bold Brave TV, and we're going to take a break for a message. And when we come back, we'll actually use one of the tools that we introduced in the last in this segment. So when we come back, one of the uh, topics we're going to uh, we're going to practice some mindful intention setting. So what we'll do is we'll do a body a mind body scan, and then we'll learn how to use mindfulness to understand where we are on the scale. So. We'll be right back after this brief message. So while we're waiting to go to break, let's do a little bit of a, that breathing exercise we introduced in an earlier show. What I'd like you to do is just focus on your in-breath, noticing you're breathing in, and as you breathe in, tell yourself, I'm breathing in. And as you exhale, you're breathing out, continuing to breathe in, And as you exhale, I'm breathing out, not changing your breath in any way. Breathing in, tracking your breath. And once you're comfortable, you can track your in-breath and your out-breath. I'd like you to count to two. Count in for two. Count out for two. In for two. Out for two. And when you're comfortable with that, breathe in a little deeper for three. And exhale for three. Gradually slowing your breath. Breathing in and out to the count of three. Allowing yourself to relax deeper and deeper. Continue to breathe. We'll take a break, and when we come from break, we'll continue with the mindfulness exercise. Did you know that your beliefs create your entire reality, but it's the subconscious beliefs that do most of the creating? Belief Shifter and Life Coach Shiraz can help you identify those limiting beliefs and eliminate them, often in a single session. Like it was almost instant, like I had relief right away. Creating better health, relationships, careers, and finances. Let Shiraz help you step out of safety and into awareness. Definitely something's happening, uh, like a, a flow inside, you know, it feels good. Whether in person or online, Shiraz provides personal coaching, belief shifting. Visit Shiraz at energeticmagic.com or call 416-529-7429. Energetic Magic on the BBM Global Network, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. Find your greater happiness. Be well. 
Be aware. Be magical. Are you struggling to care for elderly parents or a spouse? Do you wonder if being a caregiver is making you sick? Are you worried about taking time off work to care for elderly parents and balance work, life, and caregiving? Has caregiving become exhausting and emotionally draining? Are you an aging adult who wants to remain independent, but you're not sure how? I'm Pamela D. Wilson. Join me for the Caring Generation radio show for caregivers and aging adults, Wednesday evenings, 6 Pacific, 7 Mountain, 8 Central, and 9 Eastern, where I answer these questions and share tips for managing stress, family relationships, health, well-being, and more. Podcasts and transcripts of The Caring Generation are on my website, PamelaDWilson.com, plus my caregiving library, online caregiver support programs, and programs for corporations interested in supporting working caregivers. Help, hope, and support for caregivers is here on The Caring Generation and PamelaDWilson.com. Welcome back. You're with Dr. Levine on Bold Brave TV. And now we're into the practical segment of the program where we actually practice some of the skills that we've been talking about in the previous segment. So what I like to do today, we've uh, in the past covered some relaxation exercises. I'd like to introduce a body scan uh, exercise, which will, in conjunction with our scale, we can start to understand what level our baseline anxiety is. So once again, what we're going to do is we're just going to use our breath, but this time, instead of the intention being relaxing, we're going to use it uh, to get in touch with our level of arousal. So now go ahead and just hold the sensations of your breath in. You'll be able to sense maybe the air coming in through your nostrils down into your chest, that pause between the in-breath and the out-breath, and follow the air back out. Just mindfully breathing in, feeling the sensations, not trying to change anything. You're just noticing your breath. Maybe you'll notice that it is slow, in which case you're probably fairly relaxed. Or you may notice that it's actually short and shallow, which may mean that it's fairly, you're fairly aroused, or at least a sign that you could be. So now bring your attention to the rest of your body and see if there's any foot tapping, fidgeting of any kind going on. That could be a clue that you're a little more aroused than you would normally think you were. Very good. Bringing your full attention to your neck and your shoulders. Noticing if there's any tension there. And by now, if you're having trouble focusing on your body, pretty clear that you're probably at a higher level of arousal. Just see if you can notice any place where you might have an urge to move or to get up. And where that feeling to move, where it is in your body. And if you are feeling an urge, if you are feeling that your breath is shallow and you're having trouble focusing, you're probably up more in the six, seven range, maybe even an eight in terms of baseline anxiety. However, if your breath is slow, you're able to follow the body sensations and keep your mind on the exercise. You're probably in the three, four, five range. Very good. So now I'd like you to bring your full attention to your left foot. Feel any sensations that may be there. Maybe your toes touching. Maybe you can even feel warmth inside your shoe or the texture of the 
floor if you're in your bare foot. Maybe the temperature of the floor. And now bring your attention to the right feel foot and any sensations that are there. Doing great. Now bring your attention up to your left thigh. Maybe you can feel your clothing or your hand maybe on it. Maybe you'll feel some sensation and itch or whatever you weren't feeling. That's perfectly fine. Now move to your right thigh. Feeling any sensation there, maybe your clothing, touch. Now bring your attention to your buttocks in the chair and maybe your lower back. Using your sensation of touch, maybe you can feel the texture as your chair firm or soft. Bringing your attention to your stomach, your intestines. Just bringing your full attention. Noticing any sensations in your gut. A lot of people displace their anxiety to their stomach. And there's a huge gut-brain connection. Just noticing... Great. Bringing your attention now to your shoulders and your arms. Your left arm first. Feeling any heaviness or where it's touching something. Bringing your attention to your each finger in turn on your left hand, starting with your pinky. Noticing any tension, any sensation in each finger till you get to the thumb. Now going to the right arm. Feeling any sensation in the right arm. If any thoughts come, just acknowledge them as a thought. That's what brains do. Just let it go. Come back. Feeling any sensations in your right pinky. And each finger in turn. Feeling if there's any tension in your neck. Now scan your top of your head and your face for any sensations. And that's mindfulness of body. And the body will tell us when we're aroused and how aroused we are. And in a way, the fact that if we have difficulty staying on exercise and staying on task, we already know that we're having we're more aroused. So now let's just do mindfulness of thought. As you sit here, just imagine your mind is like a clearing in the woods or a stream. And just notice the next thought that comes. Let it rise into your awareness. And let it fade. The true exercise is to catch when we get lost in a thought and bring ourselves back. And we can use our breath as the anchor. So if you do catch yourself off thinking, what, what am I going to do later today? Or, gee, this is slow or whatever. 
just bring your full attention back to breathing in, the sensations of breathing in and exhaling, and then go back to observing your thoughts. When a thought comes, just acknowledge it as a thought and then let it go. Practicing seeing thoughts and letting them go. Over time, you'll start to notice a particular pattern. Maybe when you're anxious, when you're sitting here trying to do this exercise, you'll find you'll be thinking of things you need to do later in the day if you're an anticipator. Or if maybe if you're anxious about finances, you'll find you'll keep coming back to thoughts about spending or making money. We all kind of have our go-to when we're anxious, a pattern of thoughts. So just observe as the thoughts rise and fall. Maybe what kind of content they have, but don't analyze them, just observe. We're looking to observe the thought, not analyze it. Observing the thoughts come, dismissing and letting them go. Noticing any other sensation that comes up in the body, watching it rise and fall. Learning, learning to follow sensations and dismiss them as well as allowing thoughts to come and go. One of the things we can learn in this exercise is just how transient thoughts and sensations really are. They rise. They rise into our awareness. And we can either choose to focus on them or we can dismiss them and they'll just flow away. One more time, let's do a body scan, finding any places we're holding tension and we'll let the tension go. Breathing in deeply, exhaling, noticing if your breath has changed as you focused intently on doing your mindfulness. Scanning your face, your neck, your shoulders for any tension. If you find any, just breathe deeply into that area. And then exhale that tension. Breathing in again. Exhaling. Scanning our chest, our stomach and buttocks. Again, if any tension, breathing into that area, exhaling, and now our legs and our feet. Great. Take one last deep breath in. Exhale. And come right back after this short break as we wrap this session up and go on to a, the next session where we'll learn more about mind-body skills and cognitive wellness. Thank you. Mike Zorick, a three-time California state champion in Greco-Roman wrestling at 114 pounds. Mike, blind since birth, was born in Hartford, Connecticut. He was a six-time national placer, including two seconds, two-thirds, and two-fourths. He also won the Veterans Folk Style Wrestling twice at 152 pounds. In all these tournaments, he was the only blind competitor. 
Nancy Zorick, a creative spirit whose talents have taken her to the stage and into galleries and exhibitions in several states. Her father, a commercial artist who shared his instruments with his daughter and helped her fine tune her natural abilities, influenced her decision to follow in his footsteps. Ms. Zorick has enjoyed a fruitful career doing what she loves. Listen Saturday mornings at 12 Eastern for the Nancy and Mike Show for heartwarming stories and interesting talk on the BBM Global Network. Dr. R.C. will share extraordinary resources and services that promote educational success as well as making a difference in the lives of all social workers as well as the lives of children, adolescents, and teens of today. She will have open discussions addressing many of the issues that we face about our youth and how being employed in the uniquely skilled profession of social work for over 18 years has taught invaluable lessons through her personal experiences. She will also provide real-life facts, examples, and personal stories that will confirm that why serving as a child advocate is extremely beneficial when addressing the needs of the whole child. Listen live to Dare to Soar, Saturdays, 10 a.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network, and tune in radio as Dr. R.C. will provide thought-provoking information that will empower, encourage, and strengthen students, families, and communities across our nation. You can also visit her at soarwithkatie.com. Welcome back to Dr. Levine's Practical Neuropsychology on Bold Brave TV. I'm Dr. Levine, and we're back with the program that helps you learn emotional regulation, improve your motivation, and change some, some habits. So <clears throat> we're starting out with uh, some very basic mind-body skills, the first of which is to be even be aware of how uh, stressed or tense we really are. I find that a lot of the folks that uh, come to me really aren't aware that they're stressed and anxious until they're having difficulty sleeping or focusing on tasks. So we've learned some scales, some scale to help us under, uh, understand our level of stress and anxiety. And then the very first mind-body skill is we have to learn how to turn down the sympathetic, that fight or flight, and turn on the parasympathetic. And these are what we call bottom-up skills. And the most significant of that is progressive muscle relaxation. And by conditioning progressive muscle relaxation, what I found with most of my clients that within two weeks, They've conditioned the response so that when they take a deep breath, their body knows how to relax on command. And then by four weeks, they've reduced their overall baseline uh, stress and anxiety so they can tolerate uh, other things that are more stressful, including exposure therapy if they're having trouble with some form of anxiety or trauma. Now, Sometimes progressive muscle relaxation uh, doesn't work for some people. They have trouble focusing or they're very uncomfortable doing it or they may have some physical ailment, in which case uh, we can start out with breathing exercises, gradually increasing those. We've, uh, uh, <clears throat> I have also used hypnosis uh, for people who just have trouble getting the skills. So we can use hypnosis as well as biofeedback tools to get that relaxation, that ability to turn off and retrain the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. So that puts our mind in a state where we're teachable, where we can learn new skills. And <clears throat> one of the key skills for emotions is visioning. And by visioning, I'm saying you, using our imagination. So if we're really anxious, we can, uh, instead of trying to reason on the problem, which may end up just uh, making us more anxious, we could uh, envision taking a little three or five minute break at the beach, literally taking a few breaths, using our imagination to put ourselves in 
at the beach or wherever we find relaxing. It might be the mountains for you, but just the ability to take some deep breaths, uh, maybe take a few minutes to do a breathing exercise, and then uh, using all of our senses, vision, wherever it is that we've relaxed in the past. So let's assume it's the beach, you know, you see, your, see the sky, see the waves, the sounds, hear the waves and the gulls and the sounds of the, of the people that are there at the beach, all the sounds, or if it's in the mountains, whatever sounds are there, what would you touch? Like you could use the warmth of the sun on your face or the uh, hot sand beneath your feet or the cool waves bringing touch in all the senses. And of course, smell. Maybe you'll smell the salty air or suntan lotion, whatever senses there. And you might even taste, uh, say you have a favorite lemonade or something. So if you take the time when you're visioning to really put yourself there by going through each sense and reawaking that period after a few minutes of breathing and a few minutes of visioning, you'll have given your body a chance to metabolize some of those stress hormones rather than working it uh, up, you'll be working it down using visualization instead of reasoning. Many of my clients find it amazing that they've been trying to use reasoning on anxiety and it just hasn't worked. So what we introduced today is the next skill after visioning. So we have relaxing skills, we have then visioning skills, and now we're moving on to mindfulness. And mindfulness is simply being present in the moment, being aware of all our sensations and being able to tolerate them and letting our bodies inform us of how aroused we are. And you'll also find that you'll gain new insights as to what's really bothering you. So mindfulness is critical in terms of being in the present moment, but <clears throat> It's also critical in understanding when we're trying to avoid something. So mindfulness will give us increased awareness and it'll also uh, train our attention so that even if we are aroused, we'll be able to focus at the task at hand and function much better. So as we move forward, we'll uh, review the stress management we covered in the fourth episode, which is a whole bunch of skills to reduce the stress and anxiety in our life. We'll learn some tools to help with motivation in changing bad habits. So keep coming back to Dr. Levine's Practical Neuropsychology, where we learn how to mind-body skills and have cognitive wellness tools that'll help us become much more balanced, reduce our stress, and be happy and change uh, bad habits for good. So we're glad to have you here on Bold Brave TV, Dr. Levine's Practical Neuropsychotherapy. We'll see you again next Monday at 11 p.m. or 11 a.m., sorry. And you can reach me at drlevine.com. That's D-O-C-T-O-R-L-A-V-I-N-E.com. This has been Dr. Levine's Practical Neuropsychology Show. Break old patterns and easily change negative habits with lessons that keep rewarding you for the rest of your life. Here Mondays at 1 p.m. Eastern on the Bold Brave TV Network.